Oh, I love your enthusiasm in the front row. I'm all about it. Let's give an applause for our last panel. I think, I, I think that makes sense. And for our next panel. So I have to say the only downside of this festival today, the only bad thing about it is it makes you kind of feel a bit inadequate. All of these people are, have been changing the world in extraordinary ways, including the people on the stage behind us. So I'm so honored to introduce them. They are modern day Antigones. They are young women who are making a difference politically and socially and bringing about social justice in the face of immense odds. And so we're really honored to have these modern day Antigones to close the festival out for us tonight. Um, they are our last panelists, but certainly not least. Instead of being paralyzed by fear and anger, Sarah Clements turned to activism after her mother survived the tragic shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School, which of course we all remember. Sarah, Sarah right there. Let's give her a round of applause. Meanwhile, Jessica, is it Mindich or Mindich? Mindich. Mindich, okay, I'm supposed to ask that upstairs. Jessica Mindich has proved that fashion is not just pretty, but can be pretty powerful. She has created a jewelry line that is made out of illegal guns acquired through voluntary buyback and amnesty programs. So think about that for a second. She is using fashion to bring about social change. So let's give it up for Jessica. I also said she reminds me of a certain redheaded actress, but I'm curious to see if you all will agree and can think of who I'm talking about. Um, and they will both be interviewed by the extraordinary Wesley Lowry, who you've definitely seen on television. You've read his work in the Washington Post. He's a Pulitzer Prize winner, and his first book is coming out that I cannot wait to read, which is titled, They Can't Kill Us All, Ferguson, Baltimore, and a New Era in America's Racial Justice Movement. Let's give them all a round of applause. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Kelly, for those, for those introductions. Um, when I moderate, I, I operate by one rule, which is that you shouldn't hear my voice very much because I'm always just as much excited to hear um, from the people who I'm talking to as you all are. And so this is going to be some of the last you hear of me. But what, what, what I thought made sense, you know, we're here today at a time when a lot of politics is being talked about, but not a ton of policy. And I'm really excited to have kind of a, a high-end kind of like a policy conversation, a conversation about something that matters, and that's gun violence. Um, the idea that, you know, we live in a country where uh, 90 people a day are, are being killed with firearms. Um, and, you know, we're here with two remarkable women who have done work and are doing work to try to both bring awareness to this issue that very often gets lost when it's not in the headlines, but also trying to figure out how we cut down on that and, and prevent uh, this level of, you know, carnage. Uh, and so I want to start off by allowing you both to kind of tell us a little bit more about how you find yourself here on the stage, right? Tell us a little bit about your backgrounds, about who you are and what brought you, what first brought you into this conversation. Sarah, you wanna start? Sure, um, thank you. Um, so I uh, am a student at Georgetown University, um, but almost four years ago now, uh, my mother survived the shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School. Um, I grew up in Newtown um, and you know, we moved there initially because of the school system, because it was safe than, safer than we were, where we were before, um, which now saying that um, sort of gives me the chills. Um, but my mother uh, was a second grade teacher at Sandy Hook for a few years um, when on December 14th, 2012, um, she survived a mass shooter, came into her elementary school. Um, he ended up turning left down the hallway killed um, six of her colleagues and 20 first grade students in their classrooms. My mother, her classroom was on the right side. Um, it was the second door down and she and her students survived that day. Um, but ever since, um, myself, my mom, my whole family have all been involved in gun violence prevention work. Um, our sort of phrase that came out of that day was uh, honor with action that we want to honor the 26 people whose lives were taken in my former elementary school um, with positive change to make sure that other people don't have to experience what we experienced. Um, so almost four years later, I'm still organizing. I'm basically mostly focused on uh, youth advocacy in this space. Um, and I do a lot of campus organizing and work with students to get involved. 
Um, I had been a philanthropic jeweler designer since 2008. I knew nothing about gun violence in America. Um, it was not an issue of mine. Cory Booker asked me to create uh, jewelry in Newark to help what he felt was the most profound purpose, peace, and to take some of the weapons out of his ballistics lab, and he had no more room there. And so I did, and I just thought I was doing another cool project in jewelry design. Ten months later, you and I are tied together in a very weird way. Ten months later, we launched this collection, and then 16 days later, Sandy Hook happened. And unbelievably, um, my office was from New York City. You passed my office on the way to the state capitol in Hartford. And we had the only hopeful story in what was a 24-7 news cycle of mourning, international mourning. And here we had a jewelry piece that became an international symbol of hope in what was a sea of mourning that journalists would call me from all over the world crying because they did not understand what was going on in America. And um, the only silver lining that came out of Sandy Hook was that people now understood we had a real problem in America. And after 10 months, I now understood the real problem um, that was happening in America with gun violence. And my entire world of being a philanthropic jewelry designer shifted and I really understood that there was some kind of divine intervention and I went deeper and deeper into the world of gun violence and it, jewelry became this shiny symbol that led me on this path of learning and being an advocate for the, a cause of gun violence prevention and we've since partnered not only with Newark but uh, the Caliber Collection um, raises funds to take illegal guns off the streets in Detroit, San Francisco, Hartford, Newark and we are just launching Miami next week. And we've been able to take quite a lot of guns off the streets. So, so what, what strikes me about both of your stories is that in many ways you become unlikely activists. You know, people who had not necessarily sought out or had planned to do, to do this type of work. Um, what, what was that journey like in some ways, be, you know, all of a sudden being thrust into something that can be, um, can, can be polarizing, it can be tough, and, and I think that, you know, also, um, you know, so much of the spirit and the ethos of kind of Antigone is this idea uh, of taking stands that may or may not be popular, right? Or, 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 or positioning yourself in ways um, to tell the truth, even when sometimes people don't want to hear that. What are some of your experiences kind of being in those positions? Yeah, I think um, the phrase that a lot of us in this movement and probably in others use is um, accidental activists, that we sort of feel like this wasn't you know, a conscious choice uh, initially that we decided, sat ourselves down and said, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be an activist today. Um, something happened to us and we decided to try and work to make positive change out of that tragedy. Um, I think for me, I didn't start my activism until af about a month after the shooting in my town. Um, I ended up seeing a Facebook ad for a march on Washington for gun control, it was called. And I just decided I wanted and needed to go to that. And that was my first activist first thing. Time. That was my first thing that I did. And my dad and I uh, went down to DC in mid-January together. It was freezing cold. And we marched with 6,000 other Americans who had come to mourn what happened in my community and ask for change. And um, seeing all those people, and then I think finally meeting some of the first survivors of other gun violence incidents um, for the first time, that was really what motivated me to go back to Newtown and to, you know, actually get down on the ground and do this work. Um, show, seeing other people who had experienced something similar and heal through that, through the process of standing up to make change was probably what gave me, you know, the strength to, to move forward. Interestingly, I think that for Sarah, having it touch her life personally, it wasn't an option mm -hmm. for her, whether, whether you call it an accidental activist or it's not optional. For me, when I spent 10 months in a ballistics lab in Newark and learned the um, just depravity of humanity that is going on on the streets every weekend and the loss of human life and just the news is not covering it and we're losing children and there are children growing up without fundamental basic rights and 
nobody cares. It felt like nobody cared. And you can't walk on the ballistics lab floor every Monday morning because there are Uzis and semi-automatics covering the floor that are swept off the streets through crimes every weekend. And nobody cares and you, you want to scream. I didn't feel like I had a choice either. And it, this wasn't something that affected my mother or it didn't affect my family, but it felt like it was affecting me in the same way that I didn't have a choice to not do it. Um, so it felt like an assault on my life that um, I, couldn't not I couldn't turn away from it. So, what, so what, have, what have been some of the difficulties in this activism space, right? Whether, whether to whatever extent you guys are accidental activists and whatever, to whatever extent that kind of quickly evolves, um, what what has that what's that looked like kind of moving forward and and you've received any pushback have you been, what what is it what's that looked like I'll start um, I think just generally one of the most difficult things about working in the gun violence prevention movement is that there are so many different um, experiences uh, and understandings of gun violence gun culture just guns in general in the U S. Um, you know, your experience with guns can change depending on your age, um, your family background, where you grew up, uh, what type of experiences you had as you were growing up. And, you know, I think uh, people have so many different relationships with guns, whether positive or negative, um, and that makes it really hard to navigate um, the politics of the issue and the politics of the gun violence prevention movement because there are people coming at the issue from so many different experiences and vantage points. So I think um, having, you know, just starting out with the understanding that there are all of these different under, like, concerns um, about safety and what does community look like, what does ending gun violence even mean for different communities, those are some of the basic questions we have to start off with um, in our movement in order to find solutions that you know, don't necessarily mm -hmm. aggravate one community or the other. Of course. I think it's getting, um, getting the energy and the outrage that comes after the, the horrible mass homicides that capture the world's attention to be sustained enough to care about the loss of young black lives and that occur every day in care about urban violence and understand that nobody kill, nobody takes up a gun and kills somebody because there were awash in guns and illegal guns and care about the real issues affecting society. How, how do you sustain this type of work or attention? You know, we, we find ourselves coming to this conversation after a terrible hashtag or after a terrible event, after a Sandy Harkler and Aurora um, how do we, but what we know is that, you know, there are people every single day, uh, victims of gun violence, right? This, is, this isn't something that is only occurring when we are paying attention. In fact, it's occurring just as much, if not more, when we've got our back turned. How, how does, what does a Tuesday morning look like? Or a Wednesday morning? Or a Thursday afternoon? Like, how, how does this work continue even when everyone's not paying attention? What does that look like? You shine a, a sparkly <laughs> bracelet in front of them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, you get really resourceful, you tap dance, you take every means you can because it's really hard mm -hmm. to do that. I mean, you write an amazing book with an incendiary title, <laughs> right? Yeah. I think for, from my experience, from an organizing standpoint, it's um, capacity building, right? Like even when people aren't looking, um, even if people aren't reading the headlines or caring about one incident or another, um, I think our people in our movement feel a sense of responsibility that as we see gun violence happening on our own streets, in our own communities, to our own families, we have to be reaching out to survivors, we have to be reaching out to gun owners, to anybody who might have a stake in this issue. And down the road, it's, it's hard to think about this issue in the long term because people are losing their lives every day um, and because it feels so urgent. But I think having a lens sometimes of what does the long road look for us, um, is important because we have to understand all of the different components and pieces of people's experiences in the U.S. in order to reach our, our end goal. Of course. Now, now what if, what surprised you? You know, again, kind of going back to this theme of being an accidental activist or, or you know, not, this is not necessarily something either of you have been preparing for, your, you know, your lives to do, right? What, as you've, as you've learned and as you've kind of grown in this space, is there anything that surprised you or, or struck you as not as you expected it? People are pretty amazing. 
they do surprise you. People, there are amazing people out there who really want to help, and they just don't know how. And so if you ask them and you show them the way, there are really amazing people. Have you met the most amazing people? You have some supporters here mm -hmm. that are amazing mm -hmm. and they are out there and they just don't know how to, how to help and how they can be helpful. And one of the um, best things that I can do is show people how they can give back, how they can be effective, how they can be better in their communities um, and be helpful. That's mm -hmm because I've been exposed and know the, know the tools to give them, that's a really great way because people are willing. And how can, how can people be helped? I mean, that begs the question then of when, when someone comes to you and says, I, I, I want to do something, I need to do something, uh, what, what's the response to them? How, how do people who, who care about this, how do they get involved? I think we have to, um, as a movement, we've done a really good job in the last couple of years of creating sort of a ladder of engagement for people, um, you know, for smaller um, but still important actions. We have a lot more resources on how to reach your elected officials, on how to be successful and impactful on social media in this space, creating hashtags that our entire movement can rally around, whether it's just in general or after incidents occur. Um, but I think also as our movement has been growing post Newtown especially, um, we're seeing a different, a wide range of organizations come up that is really critical for a sustainable movement to exist. So whether it's the smaller community organizations that you can research on mm -hmm. and Google, um, you know, what's near me basically, um, or these national organizations like Everytown or Brady or ARS that are doing work on a national scale um, and also ranging from different ideologies. I think that's critical to understand, uh, understanding the landscape of the movement. Of course. We work entirely outside of the political space. We're really talking about individuals and their communities and recognizing people within their communities and business owners who want a way to give back. So we have an expression called raise the caliber. And so whether it's a parent being a better parent or somebody in the community volunteering their time, that's how you raise the caliber. Or within business, within our business, we, we partner with other um, creatives who want to, within their own business, have a way to create a product that gives back to our foundation so we can give back to a community, give scholarships, um, help the basketball courts in a community so kids can get out there and play and have something to do, give back to community programs. So it's about how you can raise the caliber of your community mm -hmm. because people are very, very divided and behind their own closed doors and don't realize that we are a community that needs each other and we need to support each other and people are hurting and they need to, um, sometimes it's just a little bit of community outreach that can really help people who are um, disenfranchised from each other. Now, I know when I talk to people sometimes there's a frustration because there's a feeling like, why hasn't this changed or why isn't this changing, right? There, there can be this sense of hopelessness or apathy that's bred of, well, we saw that terrible thing and we all, we're excited and we, we wanted to do something and we, and we didn't see it, we didn't achieve it. How, how do you both individually stay encouraged, but then also what do you say to people who, who start to feel that way, who feel like if we couldn't do this after Sandy Hook, why might we do this now? Or if we couldn't do it after Columbine, why might we do this now? What, what, what do you say in response to that? I think um, for me, I think I've felt both sides of that. And I think it's a constant balance and tug and pull of the two sides. On the one hand, people in and out of Newtown have that question of why isn't anything being done, especially from our elected officials. Um, I think for me personally, um, one of the things that helps me the most to understand this sort of arc of justice idea of how long of a haul this is going to be um, is thinking about other social movements um, and how long it took after their sort of tipping point. If you think that Newtown was the tipping point for gun violence in the United States, um, let's, you know, for example, have um, the Stonewall riots for LGBT rights. It took them like 30 to 40 years post Stonewall to build a capacity, build a movement, um, and get uh, gay marriage uh, enacted in the United States. Mm -hmm. And that was literally generations of activists working on one issue for years and years and years and years of people saying, how has this not happened yet? Um, as other countries in the, <laughs> in the world are doing what we're trying to work on. Um, and so I think using other political movements as a model is a really helpful way to understand the timeline of 
of this movement and of how long cultural change and political change actually takes in the United States. It takes a long time and working on both the cultural side and the political side of the issue is necessary in order to reach our end goal of less gun deaths a year. Um, because gun culture is so embedded in the United States, in American culture, but also because our politics and you know, uh, regulations are so lax uh, on the issue. So both of those things need to be worked on. I mean, there are human lives at stake. You can't, it's just not an option to give up. You just can't. Mm -hmm. if, if I gave you a magic wand tomorrow, what, what, were the, what would be the three things you did on this issue? What, what are, as we talk about solutions, what, what do you think is, is essential and vital to, to limiting gun violence? It has nothing to do with guns. It has to do with, a, with poverty, with mass incarceration. It has to do with, with a massive racial divide that exists in this country. It's so systemic that if we go back to really the core issues that are driving this divide, the, that we have two Americas, maybe four Americas, I don't even know how many Americas we have, but I would, I would wave a magic wand over our segregated school system and um, the allocation of resources in this country and fix our broken system. We are so broken. Um, that's where I would wave my magic wand. And I think it, a lot of change would come there. I definitely, um Definitely agree with um, sort of the intersectionality of all of these different issues, um, but I think in terms of three like tangible things that I would want to happen initially, um, especially in terms of policy, it would be um, universal expanded background checks on all gun sales in the United States. Um, some uh, states have already passed that legislation post Newtown, but basically um, not all gun sales are covered uh, by the NICS background check system right now, especially gun sales online from online purchases and at gun shows aren't necessarily checked. Um, so I think that legislation, which we've been pushing for for even since even yeah. before Sandy Hook, um, a second one would be uh, stricter legislation on regulating gun trafficking, um, because one of the reasons we see so many guns on the streets, especially in inner city areas, is because there's what's called an iron pipeline, um, basically of uh, traffickers who, who buy guns from bad apple gun dealers, gun dealers who we know give illegal guns to these sellers um, in states that have really lax gun laws. They literally drive the guns up to New York City, to Newark, New Jersey, to Detroit, to Chicago, and they deal them illegally. Um, there is no legislation that's stopping them from inner city trafficking. Um, and then the third thing that I would do is probably, again, what some states have already been doing, which is awesome, but um, cracking down on uh, domestic abusers, domestic uh, violence uh, felons that have been accused of committing um, assaults or harassment um, of someone they live with or um, are married to. Um, there are many states that do not have regulations against those individuals owning and purchasing firearms. It's a huge loophole in the background check system, um, and I think it would um, address a lot of uh, gun suicides and domestic violence um, with guns in the U.S. What would you wave your magic wand on? What would I wave a magic wand? I said I didn't want to talk. Come on. What, what <laughs> I would, you know, I think it'd be a cross between the, the, the two things you guys, the two kind of sets that you all talked about, right? This idea of, of recognizing kind of the social ills. Um, and I think that, you know, one thing that's fascinating is I talk to police officers very often and police chiefs very often, right? Is that this is something that uh, the police care a lot about. You know that that they argue and they and they talk about one of the reasons that there are so many uh, police shootings or state violence very often is because they because they are so afraid of encountering people with guns and they very often are encountering people with guns and guns that have been obtained illegally or guns that uh, and and guns they've had trouble tracking and getting off of the streets and so there is a real concern in, among a lot of American law enforcement who I talk to uh, of, about how do we and these are all people who are extremely pro-Second Amendment for the most part, but who are out every day and, and who are seeing what you, what you saw on the, on the, in the floor of the inventory, right? This, like, seeing this weaponry and, and worrying about this weaponry every day. And so I think that, you know, with, with my wand, I definitely think that, um, I, I certainly think that that would be part of the conversation. And I, and I also think that, um, we were talking a little bit off stage, I, I would also, 
if I could do something, it, it would largely be about seeing us be able to solve so many of these crimes with victims. Um, when, when we talk about gun, gun crime, uh, we're talking about you know, someone whose rights have been violated and who very often we're not seeing these crimes being solved, right? That, that most victims of gun violence are, are, are not, in fact, seeing their perpetrator arrested or going to, to jail. And, and when you know, I work in a space that talks a lot about trust and, and about uh, trust for law enforcement. And, and I think we see in many of our communities, communities that um, feel both over-policed and under-policed, that they feel like they are, they're receiving a lot of interaction at very low levels with police officers, but that when something egregious is done to them, they're, they're not receiving justice. And I think that that um, is really at the heart of a lot of our conversation about how do we restore trust in communities. Um, and so I think that that would be, not that that's a very clean or easy magic wand thing, because that, that encompasses a lot as well, but I think that would be a big part of it. Um, you know, you know, one thing that struck me as both of you guys were talking w was this idea of relative intersectionality, that, that none of these issues exist in any type of vacuum, right? That gun violence relates to poverty as it relates to other type of social Ill ills, that the movement um, to stop gun violence is related to other social movements that exist. What does that look like? H how do you, I mean, how would you, I guess, how would you assess the current state of that intersectionality? Do you think the gun rights movement, or the, the, the gun uh, violence prevention movement works well with other social movements currently? And how can there be more bridges fostered between various movements to build, work towards you know, common goals? I think um, this is an area that um, our movement needs to do a lot better on. Um, I think uh, before Newtown, it was largely, um, there were sort of two areas of the gun violence prevention movement. One was, larger national organizations that were operating out of New York or DC, mm -hmm. um, and, that, and mainly working on court cases and policy. Um, and then there were organizations that were community-based or even neighborhood-based that do one-on-one -on -one conflict mediation with gang members, et cetera, um, and none of them were talking. Um, and I think one of the positive things that came out of the gun violence prevention movement post Newtown was that our organizations first of all started talking more and started communicating and um, strategizing together more, um, but also that more organizations grew from this coalition. Um, I think actually after the Orlando shooting this summer is when uh, we really saw more intersectional organizations popping up um, at sort of the gun violence table or sort of this table where leaders in the movement sit and strategize and talk. Um, we see groups like Pride Fund, like Gays Against Guns, who are um, sort of smaller groups, but um, mainly driven on social media and directly address the intersection between LGBT rights and violence committed against queer communities and gun violence and gun policy and starting to talk about those connections. So there are, I think, a few LGBT um, lens <laughs> organizations is one example, but I think there are a couple that are starting to pop up that directly address criminal justice reform and gun violence prevention mm -hmm. as, like you said, maybe two things that don't necessarily have to be knocking heads. It's, it still is a long way to go. It's still, it's, there's no reason for there to be so many divisions. I really credit uh, the, the Sandy Hook community for being so brave and in the face of such enormous devastation for being, I mean, like unbelievable heroes and coming out and charging with, with tragedy and making, n not letting this issue die. Uh, they, it is, it's incredible what they've done. And um, I just, I think that they, they, they continue to bring awareness to this issue. Um, but unity is not something that there is on this issue, and it re it represents the the all the different divisions in our current society, um, I'm sorry, go ahead. which is which is sad because it's loss of life, and that's something everybody shares together. Yeah, I just wanted to share an example um, out of Connecticut that I think is a sort of. Um, microcosm of uh, what we're seeing happen right now in this space. Um, basically, you know, after 1214, um, after the shooting at Sandy Hook, 
uh, there was a lot of conversation in communities like Bridgeport and New Haven and Hartford where gun violence has been occurring yeah. for decades nonstop, um, and nobody was really paying attention or having um, a, a national conversation about those communities. And we had a couple of, especially faith leaders out of Hartford, come to folks who were directly impacted by the shooting at, and um, by shootings in their own community. They came to Newtown and sat down with leaders in our community and said, you know, my son or my community members or my congregation members have been victims of gun violence for, in years past. Like, and you're, you know, obviously what happened at Sandy Hook was horrendous and indescribable. How can our communities reconcile this difference of understandings of safety and community and, you know, whose lives really matter in the state of Connecticut even? Um, and I think that difficult conversation happened pretty much immediately and especially with our faith leaders. Um, and it was really powerful and this coalition of folks from Newtown and from Hartford um, still exists today. Um, a lot of people from Newtown who are activists will tend to go to Hartford to their events, to their press conferences, show solidarity, show up um, for them. And they'll do the same for us. And I think that's just a representative model of how we can have that dialogue um, and move forward in a positive light. You know, one thing that at the, at the intersections of different groups and of different causes, there, there's often a, I think there can be a hesitance or a concern about stepping on toes, about cre claiming credit, about co-opting, co right? I think that it was, this occurred to me as you talked about Orlando and this idea of the space is created by tragedy, right? And, and but, but who then begins occupying this space, right? Is this a space for LGBT activism? Is this a space for gun violence activism? Is this a space for a counterterrorism conversation? Is this, how do you, how, as you traverse these spaces um, where you're seeing different movements interacting with each other and intersecting with each other, and, and as the story moves from Connecticut to the next place, how do you balance that both desire to, to, you know, to use a current conversation to continue an ongoing conversation yeah. at the same time respecting the nuances and the intricacies yeah. of the current so conversation. Yeah. Um, I think there are sort of, there's the internal answer to that and the external answer. Mm -hmm. um, I think the internal answer has to, goes back to um, sort of capacity building and coalition building sort of behind the scenes uh, from what people see on the outset of organization work. Um, it, it can be difficult, and I think that openness to having a conversation um, is the first step. Um, and I think, sort of, again, a reconciliation of, you know, what have we paid attention to, whose lives have we paid attention to in the past, that conversation is yeah. really hard, and, but it often needs to happen. Um, but on the external front, I think so much of it, too, has to do with whose voices our movements are lifting up and whose spaces we're putting you know, out to the national news or to yeah. write op-eds or to be featured on social media. You know, it might seem like a small cog in the machine of movement work, but whose stories we tell as a national movement is critical to under, for communities to look at our work and say, oh, they care about me, oh, they care about my family and my community. If they're seeing the same four people from the same type of community on television every night talking about an issue that also impacts them and has for years, that's problematic. And I think that, so I think those two um, forces are always sort of um, in the works, in an, in behind the scenes sure. and on the outset. I, I mean, I, people are experiencing personal tragedy, so it becomes, there's not ego bound up in it, but they're representing their community at that moment. And so I understand why, why it happens, why this is a challenge, this is a huge challenge. Um, like with anything, but um, it's, I don't know how, how to actually bring everybody together because we are fighting for the loss of life, um, but something has to, has to give and we have to realize that, we're, that guns travel our interstates, they don't have homes, and the, the problems that intersect um, and are causing this loss of life are drugs and gangs and um, poverty and racism and all these things, they're permeating everybody's community. So um, we have to all get together and figure it out the same way we have to figure out a lot of our social problems. Um, and I think it's great that there is, there does seem to be 
uh, people weaving into each other from all these organizations? Certainly. You know, was one thing, Sarah, you said earlier is you talked about this idea that, you know, movements take time and that very often we see the thing right in front of us and we immediately want to address it and we immediately want to jump to it. And it becomes easy sometimes to forget, one, that work was existing prior to us, right? But also um, that change takes time. Um, what do you think, you know, what do you think comes next? You know, we're, uh, the current president has talked many times about how gun violence has been one of the things that he's been frustrated that, cannot, you know, that, he, can't, that he can't wave a wand and solve that too many times he stepped to a microphone to have to address grieving families or a grieving community after some type of mass shooting incident. What, what does the future look like, uh, again, not in a political sense, but even just in terms of a maturation of this conversation, well, where do you think, you know, especially as people who are working in that space kind of intimately, for the rest of us who are not in all of those rooms, having all those conversations, what are the next things we have to, to know about and be paying attention for? I think the most immediate thing is this presidential election and this election in general. Um, this is the first uh, presidential election that's happening after Newtown. And it's, we have, you know, our movement has our eyes set on a lot of local, state, congressional, and of course the presidential campaigns. Um, as we have sort of prepped leaders and elected officials to run with gun reform unapologetically on their platforms. And that's something that quite literally has basically never happened ever, um, right? Yeah. This idea that like on your campaign website, you can have that you support a ban on high capacity magazines and assault weapons, and maybe you can wear your F reading from the NRA on your sleeve and still win your, your election. And that's huge, um, especially for not only shifting the politics of this issue in terms of like policy work in the future, but also in terms of our culture and um, how we, you know, I think so often what I hear in this, about this question from people who want to work on this issue, who feel impacted by it, who want to do more is, like you said before, well, nothing's happened so far, you know, what, what is there to do anymore and how can we, how are we still saying enough is enough over and over and over again? And I think that constant pressure um, is going to start to crack some floors. And we've seen over the summer, um, you know, my, our Senator uh, Chris Murphy led a sit-in in her filibuster and then in the House there was uh, John Lewis led a sit-in um, for hours and hours um, sharing victims of gun violence's stories and um, that's something, again, that has never happened. So as we start to put more pressure on, just sustainable pressure, um, both on our elected officials and on our elections and on our culture, um, I think we're gonna start to see those cracks happen and each little precedent is going to be huge for us. We have to celebrate those wins. Sarah's far more optimistic about the political change that is coming than, than I am because I think about the sit-in and the filibuster and I think about that they didn't work. But um, I, I am thrilled that they're going on and that we have such brave leaders, especially in our little state that could. Um, but I, what I see happening is actually things like mothers calling other mothers and saying, sorry, my son's never come to your house before. I just want to make sure, do you have any guns in the house? And that conversation happening, and that is amazing, because no one said the word gun before. Five years ago when I started this work, we didn't say the word gun, it was whispered like cancer, and now the NFL is wearing pink gloves in the month of October, and every M&M is pink, and, and, thing, and their uniforms are pink. And now we're seeing that in, in June for Gun Violence Awareness Month. Everything is orange. Empire State Building's orange. We are having a real gun violence awareness movement happening, and people are talking about guns, and they're saying, you know, we don't want our stores, our mass stores, to have allow open carry. We are actually having this grassroots movement where communities and individuals are saying, this is my community, this is my Starbucks, this is my Walmart, and we don't want this in our lives. This is what it means to carry a gun, this is what it means to have a gun in my school, we don't want our security guards in our offices armed, we don't want them in our schools armed, and they're taking charge of their own lives because they're super frustrated about the, the very, very slow pace at which Congress is taking action and, our, and we're able to get things done. So I agree with Sarah, it's amazing that sit-ins and filibusters are happening, and I watched every single second of it that we could until they cut us off at different <laughs> times. But um, 
for people who don't care, who aren't super focused on the issue, it was like a non-event to them because nothing actually happened. And um, we just lost a ruling in Connecticut that we can't sue gun manufacturers. I mean, we're losing on every front, but it's happening. We're actually challenging them. And, and um, what I'm seeing that makes me really, really excited is that conversations are happening and individuals are saying, well, we can't change the laws, but we're going to change our behavior and we're not going to allow it to happen in our own backyards. What is, a, is there any misperception of the gun violence prevention movement that you think people hold, or any, any reason why you think, what's the biggest reason you think people, uh, either who are on the fence yeah. um, ab ab about taking these types of stands or, or supporting this, or, or people, you know, what people have said to you in opposition, what, what, what do you think, um, if there's one thing that you could correct um, in terms of how people perceive this conversation, what might they it be? They think we're, they think, they think, we, I'm not we. They think they're trying to take away people's guns. Nobody is trying to take away anyone's guns. We, in fact, 90% of the, isn't the statistic 90% of NRA members support universal background checks? They just think that people who sh aren't responsible enough to own guns or there should be a, some reasonable background check before being able to buy a gun. Um, we, there was just something on the news as I was driving today that your, Samsung, people own Samsung phones, these batteries that are exploding. You can't have them in your carry-on suitcase. And everyone's yeah. like, okay, no more phones. <laughs> it's as easy as that. People are so attached to their phones. Nope, no more phones. And we're like, okay, I go into the airport and you have to disrobe, take off your shoes and everything. And we're totally fine with that. We're like, no, no. Something that can fire off 40 rounds in a millisecond. We, we're, no, no. I am not going to have to wait 24 hours for that. And it's, that's a total misconception, that we're not trying to take them away. We're just saying, like, let's just have like a pause, a moment to make sure. Yeah, that's, that's definitely um, a trope that we hear constantly. Um, I think the one that keeps me up at night and, and sort of forms a pit in my stomach is the idea that our movement doesn't care about black lives or doesn't care about poor lives or doesn't care about queer lives. Um, this idea that when people who are working in the LGBT movement um, see our movement um, as ineffective for talking about queer issues and the intersection between gun violence and queer lives. Um, that's a, an important conversation, like I mentioned before, that we need to have, but I think there is, especially in more left-leaning organizations and movements, um, and um, in especially communities of color that have been facing gun violence problems for decades, um, that's a conception, and I'm not, I would just say it's a conception that people have, and it's something that we need to work on because who, am, who are we to tell them that they're wrong? That when they look at this very white, progressive, DC, New York-based movement, that, oh no, we do care about your lives. Um, I, I just think it's something we need to be working on, and um, I think that's one that like we can very, I think the idea that, the misconception that we're trying to take away people's guns that's all stemming from the NRA, right? Like that's all stemming from the gun lobby, from fear mongering, from paranoia driven propaganda from the gun lobby. And that's something that of course we can fight back and we can correct and we can write think pieces on um, and we can show in our actions. But I think this conception that our movement doesn't care about all lives is um, something that is internal and that like we need to take the responsibility on for ourselves. Of course. So, so we've about reached our time, although we could probably spend all day talking about this. Um, I've got one more question I want to slide in, but before that, I want to just pause one more time and thank you both for coming out. Maybe we'll give them a round of applause now, um, because it's always so great. You know, one thing I love about my job is I get to talk to people who are very good about at their jobs about what they do, and, and talk to people who love what they do and care about what they do about those things. Surprise! And so that and so that's very I, I, I very much there's nothing more refreshing than talking to, to listening to a passionate person talk about their passion, right? Thank you. And so I, I've really it's really been an honor to talk with you all. Um, now I'm sure no one in this audience, but maybe some someone out there streaming turned it on and then fell asleep for the last 40 minutes, right? <laughs> and so that person out there who just woke up, if, if, ever, if, if everyone listening, if there was one thing you wanted them to take away from this conversation, what would it be? I think um, for me it would be that 
right now our movement is building like it never has before in lots of communities that we've never existed in. And we have been facing a lot of setbacks, especially in my home state just this week. Um, but that's politics and that's movement building. Um, and we can't take for granted the small wins that we've had over the past four years since Newtown. Um, and that there are so many ways to get involved now in this issue, whether in your community or on a national level, um, that in order to sustain our work, in order to keep building our community, we need to be looking out for each other, lifting each other up, having difficult conversations, and working in places we've never worked before. Um, and that's exactly what we're on the path to do. Um, we're, we as a society are very broken. And um, in order to heal and end the enormous problem of gun violence in America, we need to all come together and have a conversation. We need to heal some very deep systemic problems, and we need to raise the caliber of all of our behavior and come together as a community. Of course. Let's hear it for them one more time. Thank you. And that's actually it for today. So I just want to do a quick thank you to our amazing panelists to Sarah, to Jessica, to our amazing moderator, Wesley. I think we can all agree that Jessica's line will make for fabulous gifts for anyone in our lives, or for ourselves, perhaps, for Christmas. Caliber Collection, just throwing it out there. If anyone's listening or watching online who wants to buy me something for Christmas. Um, but I want to thank not just our guests and our moderator, but I want to thank all of you who stayed throughout the day. I know it was a long day, but it was inspiring, right? Right? Hello, was it inspiring? Yeah, I think so. And I'm only going to do this because I would get in trouble with my producers who are somewhere out there if I don't plug this. If you like interesting live conversations, please come out to the Green Space on October 27th, where I'll be hosting a conversation on the role of money and political donors in our political process. Uh, Dylan Radigan, the MSNBC host and one of the nation's premier advocates against for, for taking back our political process from the hands of people who are kind of controlling it financially, will be one of my guests. But the last thing I wanted to say is, my name is Kelly Goff, contributor to the Daily Beast in WNYC. And I stand for seeing stories about incredible people doing incredible things to make our world a better place getting told, which is why I'm so honored that I was asked to MC the Antigone Now Festival. I started this day by saying that this presidential election has been really depressing and the tone that it's setting, particularly for kids in this country. And this day is the, day, the kind of day that reminds me about how many great people there really are in this world doing great things. So thanks to all of our participants, panelists. Thanks to all of you for coming out. Thanks to the Onassis Foundation for putting together this incredible event. I want to hear more about the good things people are doing in our world. So the more of these we can get, the better. Um, and the last thing I want to do before I let you go, because I've been reading incredible tweets for the I stand for hashtag, which is actually trending now. So thanks to all of you who are tweeting today, because it's trending. And I can't think of a better tweet to end this day on. Someone tweeted, I stand for freedom, peace, and love. Can't argue with that, right? Get home safe and have a great rest of the weekend, everyone, and thanks for joining us.